You were born during the Second World War, a crisis that marked the end of the world as people had known it. and introduced horrors unheard of before. The most basic assumptions underpinning Western civilization were questioned, threatened, and even destroyed. 1944 was the year of the Battle of the Bulge, the year Anne Frank was captured by the Nazis, the year Paris was freed, and the year the Allied invasion of Europe began. On January 5th of that same year, you were born in El Paso, Texas, the second child of Blair D. Adams and Stelma Roy Adams. You grew up in a West Texas town, surrounded by the love of your family, and enjoyed a childhood in a very different America than the one we live in today. There was no television in your home. In 1944, the average cost of a brand new home was $3,400. The average yearly wage was $2,400. Gas was 15 cents a gallon, a loaf of bread 10 cents, and the cost of eggs was 55 cents a dozen. As a child, you lived a short time in Amarillo and Leveland, but Lubbock was home for most of your growing up years. More than the confines of a suburban yard, you enjoyed getting out of town to spend time on area farms and ranches or just the chance to be out in the country somewhere, whether chasing rabbits with your dog, going fishing with your dad, or simply dreaming of the horses, the cabin, the ranch you might someday have. You loved the outdoors. You were good with your hands, too. At a very young age, you began learning the disciplines of art and cherished the instruction of your beloved grandmother. She not only taught you to draw and paint, she also taught you patience perseverance, gentleness, and so much more. Your first job was as a grocery store sack boy at the age of 11. At 13, you switched to a newspaper delivery route, and at 14, you worked unloading and loading railroad boxcars and freight trucks at a large Lubbock warehouse. At 16, you worked for a while at an Indian trading post on the outskirts of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Then, as a soda jerk and short order cook in a large combination drugstore, fountain, and cafe. You graduated from Monterey High School in Lubbock, Texas, and during off school time, you loved working on ranches with the honest, simple, salt of the earth men whose lives spoke of values and virtues from an earlier time. But your life didn't stay so bright and simple for long. When you were just 20 years old, your father was torn from your life by his violent death. Suddenly, the world was a maze of questions, uncertainties, and assumptions that had to be examined, that had to be answered. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. In August of 1966, after three and a half years of college, you were drafted into the Army during the heat of the Vietnam War. After obtaining a top-secret crypto security clearance, you were stationed in Bavaria, West Germany for three years working in electronic intelligence, monitoring the activities of the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact satellites. You made lifelong friendships in Army intelligence, but your search for the answers did not cease, but rather intensified. You could no longer be content to live by the culture's unexamined assumptions and simply hope for the best. You had seen what the breakdown and failure of relationships could actually cost people. You wanted to know why relationships failed and what could possibly ever make them durable. For you, the tired, torpid answers of nominal religion seemed to offer no consolation at all. Though you didn't know it at the time, 
your soul was beginning to crave the presence of God, not just the principles of religion. You longed to encounter the voice that had formed the universe, not merely stale recitations of historical events or facts, but the living word of his power. And so, after being honorably discharged from the army and enrolling in the philosophy department at the University of Texas, in the least expected way, you who had lost your faith in God found yourself alone at the end of a fast, reaching for the only Bible you had and turning to the only prayer you'd learned as a child. There the words spilled out of your anguished soul. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Like those in an upper room in Jerusalem 2,000 years before, you waited until you were filled with power from on high. This was not religion. This was relationship. This was no principle. This was the presence of the living God. And this relationship and experience only expanded as you soon met people who prayed with you and baptized you in the name of your newfound Lord. You and mom soon married, and together you devoted yourselves entirely to the ministry of the word, to inspiring others that they too could come to know God as a living presence, as a numinous reality, even in today's world, and not just an object of religion. Thousands heard you preach and were moved by your personal testimony of transformation in churches and venues across America, from California to New York, from Canada to Mexico. But your experience in denominal churches across the country also brought a troubling revelation. In spite of many wonderful people trying their best in these churches, you discovered that something was apparently insufficient for the needs at hand. Something was incomplete in the vision. People were leaving the churches as fast or faster than they were coming in. Their youth were largely uninspired. Stagnation and entropy were the norm. Some of the same social disintegration that had so troubled you in your youth was ravaging the church as well. There was much excitement over the birth of new converts, but no one seemed to know where to go from there. After preaching a revival in Phoenix, Arizona in May 1973, you were coming down off the platform when a retired Pentecostal minister hobbled forward on crutches and leaned against your shoulders as he prophesied in an aged voice. The doors of Pentecost are closing to you, he said. I am calling you to the wilderness and waste places. But as I was with Joseph in Egypt, so shall I be with you. And whatever you put your hand to, I will bless. And so you went to the most dangerous block in Manhattan, a wilderness of crime, drug addiction, and every pain and dislocation known to the human soul. With nothing but a borrowed car, a 4 by 6 U-Haul with all your possessions, and hearts brimming with faith in the power of the love of God, you went. You encountered cultural darkness, rampant drug use, mugging in the apartment elevator, murder in front of your apartment building. Filth, cruelty, debauchery seemed everywhere. But you also discovered those diamonds in the rough, those dwelling in the valley of the shadow of death, who were just waiting for the light to dawn. And you brought that light, that ray of hope to hearts who had almost given up. And a little lighthouse of promise began to send out its undaunted rays of hope over a dark city of suffering and sorrow. Manhattan in the 1970s was a grand display of the addiction, dislocation, and isolation of the human condition in a city of nine million. It became to you like a glaring example of our culture's inadequacies. Manhattan's Lower East Side provided a glimpse of the end product of flawed cultural paradigms and assumptions. And so the voice that had guided you true up to that point began to call again. God began to sprout seedlings of new hope, new beginnings in so many lives. 
But could these new and tender plants flourish in the concrete jungle of such an antagonistic culture? A culture is an immersive environment, a habitat that either nurtures or inhibits growth. And the culture that surrounded you in urban New York was designed to foster and produce certain fruits. The education model, the entertainment, the approach to vocation, the provision of essentials like food, the order of family relationships, all these represented a culture that was fostering the very dysfunctions you were striving to help people overcome. All this provoked deep searching questions in your heart. Was the church supposed to be more than a chaplaincy service to the broader culture? The Word of God began to come alive with answers. You preach from the words of the psalmist who lamented the time when Israel was exiled in the foreign land of Babylon. By the rivers of Babylon we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps for there our captors asked songs for us. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. But how can we sing the songs of the Lord in a foreign land? The words of Jesus also where he said, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. The soil produces crops by itself. And again, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and I shall be your God, and you shall be my people. I shall be your father, and you shall be my sons and daughters. You preach that the church was called to be more than a phone booth in the great sprawling mall of the world, a phone booth where people could supposedly ring up heaven for an emergency or an occasional comfort. You began to believe that the church was supposed to actually be the kingdom of God on the earth, the place where God did not have to remain silent, a complete culture where different fruits were fostered and grown, fruits of cooperation, love, joy, brotherhood, and peace. But was it possible, was it even conceivable, that the church could become an entire alternative culture? a place of wholeness and healing, an enclave of the kingdom of heaven on earth? There were no examples at hand to look to, no real success stories of Christian community to emulate. But you were pioneers, and the vision of a kingdom throbbed in your hearts. There in the slums and ghettos of urban New York, your vision for the kingdom of God began to expand. You dreamed of a new approach to education, vocation, family relationships, and life as a whole. You dreamed of the people whose relationships would be so strong, whose love would run so deep, whose lives would be so intertwined that they would truly become the church, the people of God as it was intended to be. Like Moses who had to hear the voice from the burning bush himself before he could speak of change or exodus to the people. You let the vision burn in your own heart, and then you made it burn in the hearts of God's people too, through powerful words of inspiration and hope. And together you did something unheard of. Over 120 people broke all ties, gave up jobs and dreams, loaded up their meager possessions, and together made a modern day exodus across 1,800 miles to start a new life in a new land to give birth to the dream of Christian community, 
as they believed God had intended it to be. Now such communities have been planted and are growing around the country and the world. Now, over 200,000 visitors a year come to marvel and learn from the dream that became reality. Now it captures the amazement of theologians, the respect of sociologists, and the admiration of Christians worldwide. But back then, it was just a dream. No proof, no confirmation, no applauding crowds, no great riches to support it, just a vision and the faith to do it. Just a handful of people who dared to believe God could still do miracles in our day. The rays of hope from that little lighthouse in Manhattan have grown and multiplied until they are more like a city, a city set upon a hill that cannot be hidden. And there are new lighthouses reaching and shining to the ends of the earth. And for some who are ready to give up hope on the dream of Christian brotherhood, of the body of Christ as a viable reality in today's world, to see the city's light is to find hope again. And every time we tell the story, every time we help people believe they can realize Christian community, we're joining with your labors. Every time we hand out a book or explain a truth that could change someone's life, every time we plant a seed, we are remembering how these seeds of hope in our hands today came from great big trees that you once planted as tiny seeds. You planted and watered and tended and protected through the decades so that the fruit we now see could be possible. I just want to thank you. It's been an incredible journey. And I have lived a very full and rich life. And uh, it's because of you. It's not because of big buildings or anything. It's because of friends, and brothers, and sisters. It's because of laughter and joy and going through the good times and the hard times together and learning together to hear God's voice, to do His will. It's because of your smiling faces. It's just been wonderful. And I want to thank you for it. You're the best friends and best family anybody could ever have. And I know I don't deserve you, but I'm very thankful and I love you. I love you very much. I see Brother Webb. I tell you, I love you. I love all of you. You know I do. Amen, you're my joy. Isn't that what Paul said? I love you very, very much. Thank you for not letting defeat and anguish snuff out the promise or purpose God put inside of you. You have been a wonderful father to 10 children and really to many more. And your children have known real love, deep, sincere love. Thank you. Thank you for being unwilling to skip across the shallows, but rather going deep to tap well springs of hope that others might drink from. Thank you for being a man of radical faith for pressing the limits of trust and proving God's goodness time and again. Thank you for never wavering from speaking God's life-changing truth to the church. Thank you for being willing to sacrifice your comforts, your health, your everything to communicate this promise 
in volumes of books, through countless spoken messages, and through the witness of a whole life. the cloud of heroes who have run this race and a voice keeps saying this is where I'm meant to be I'll be there someday I can go the distance I will find my way if I can be strong When I go the distance, I'll be right where I belong. Down a long, rough road, through a narrow gate. It's the road that's traveled, but it leads me to you. And a thousand years would be worth the wait It might take a lifetime But somehow I'll see it through And I won't look back I can go the distance And I'll stay on track It's an uphill slope, but I won't lose hope till I go the distance. Till I find my heroes well